Thank you. You may be seated. I want to continue um, sharing this morning on uh, a series I started a while ago entitled Relating to One Another. And uh, the topic for today is based on Ephesians chapter 4. And I've entitled it Bearing with One Another in Love. You know, Scripture has a lot of one another's, and this morning, um, I want to just focus on another one another in Scripture, and I find this to be a really exciting series as I'm studying it personally. You know, last time when I went over relating to one another, I spent the majority of the time discussing the importance of our fellowship together. And so this morning, uh, I want to spend the majority of our time here on Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, and, and just to help us to understand that God's Word has a lot to say about how we relate to one another, and specifically in bearing with one another, how we, how we walk together as children of God. I wanted to put this up here just, just in case some of you were confused about bearing with one another. This is not what I'm talking about, bearing with one, just in case you're wondering. Um, you know, sometimes we, we, we get into some of these things and we do end up bearing with one another more like this, right? And uh, that is not what, what this scripture verse talks about. But just to have some fun with it, how can a bear catch fish without a pole? Any thoughts? They use their bare hands. Just thought I'd put that out there. What do you call a bear with no teeth? A gummy bear. There you go. I'm going to actually stop there. We'll get in with the word of God here. Ephesians chapter 4, if you want to turn there with me to verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Well, I'll read that together. Therefore, or I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 1 talks about our high calling. So he, as, as Paul is communicating this message here, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, remember as he's writing the book of Ephesians, he's actually um, in a prison cell. And he's a prisoner for the Lord. And he's appealing to the church, to the Ephesian church here. And he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And if we're thinking about this topic, bearing with one another in love, one of the ways that we can bear with one another in love is to understand that God has a calling upon our lives as Christians. Every single one of us. In fact, it's a high calling. And he urges us here. And, and when you're seeing this word urge, it's, it's almost like with this tone of, of um, like there's a sense of urgency. And he says here, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Well, what's different about a Christian calling versus that of someone who is living in the world? You know, one of the, the clear differences is that in our testimony and how we relate to one another. You know, every single one of us um, has an area of influence in our life. Whether it's through family members, um, maybe unsaved family members, uh, friends that you're involved in, maybe even in your workplace. Maybe in your workplace uh, you've communicated this thought that I'm a Christian. 
God has called me to a high calling in my life. Well, because of you communicating that, because your boss, because your co-workers know that, you make a priority on Sundays to worship with God's people. Like you have a standard in your life because of those things. You have a high calling in your life when it comes to bearing with one another. If the topic of your conversations, if, if you come into work every day and you're whining and you're complaining and you're grumbling and, you're, and, and you have nothing nice to say about your wife, your husband, your children, your family, your church, if you, if you live your life where you're putting people down, you're not bearing with one another in love. And you're not walking worthy of this high calling that God has called you towards. When you spend time with your extended family members, and they know that, you know, brother so-and-so sister here has said that she's a born-again Christian. But the life that's coming out of them is anything but that. You're not bearing with one another in love. You're not demonstrating this high calling that God has called you to. You know, I was talking to a business owner a number of years ago. And you know what? He, he actually said this to me. He said, some of my worst customers are people who, who when they come in, they make it known that they're Christians. That's a pretty sad testimony. To walk worthy of the calling to which we have been called, we relate to one another in a Christian way. We bear with one another in a spirit of love so that the watching world around us sees that, hey, this guy communicates a lot of good things, but he also lives them out. His walk matches his talk. Even tonight, as we celebrate communion, one of the beautiful things we demonstrate in communion is our oneness, where we gather together as children of God and we remember what Christ has done for us. We demonstrate a good testimony when we get together without criticizing, without judging, without condemning, where we examine ourselves according to what 1 Corinthians 11 says. We examine ourselves and then we take of the bread and of the cup. And I just want to encourage you tonight again, as we get together, focus on your own walk with the Lord as you remember him. I urge you, he says, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. In verse 2, he says, with all humility, with all humility. If we want to bear with one another in love, we must do it with a spirit of humility. And I want to share what C.S. Lewis says about humility here. He says, do not imagine that if you meet a really humble man, he will be what most people call humble nowadays. He will not be a sort of greasy, smarmy person who is always telling you that, of course, he is nobody. Probably all you will think about him is that he seemed a cheerful, intelligent chap who took a real interest in what you said to him. If you do dislike him, it will be because you feel a little envious of anyone who seems to enjoy life so easily. He will not be thinking about humility. He will not be thinking about himself at all. Then he says if, this, if anyone would like to acquire humility, I can, I think, tell him the first step. The first step is to realize that one is proud. And a bigger step too. At least nothing, whatever, can be done before it. He says, if you think you are not conceited, it means you are very conceited indeed. That's what C.S. Lewis says. And there's some really good principles in that. As we think about bearing with one another in love, um, we, we, you know, you, you can't go around advertising that you're the most humble person in the sanctuary because you're revealing at that point exactly 
the amount of pride that you have inside of you. You know, C.S. Lewis says this, the first step towards humility is acknowledging that you have a problem with pride. And you know what? Every single one of us, at times, we struggle with this, this quality of humility. Because there's, there's, there's the flesh about us that desires to exert ourselves, to propel ourselves to the forefront. And, and it's that area that we need to work on in our own lives. The, the most humble people, like he says here, will not be thinking about humility. In fact, he says, they will not even be thinking about themselves at all. I think this is an incredibly important trait as we think about bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love. You know, one of the things that we often share with our pre-marriage class here is Romans chapter 12, verse 10, which says, outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. Putting, putting others, other people's um, preferences and, and the things that they need in front of your own. In Luke chapter 18, verse 11, there's just a fantastic description there. Uh, Luke 18, 11 says, The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. So Jesus is giving this example of this Pharisee and this publican who went up into the temple to pray. And here's this Pharisee, this religious leader, dressed in all his religious garments, and he's praying to God, and he's like, God, I thank you that I'm not like all of these sinners around me. So he says, I'm not like other men, or extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or, or even like this tax collector that was praying there next to him. And he said this, I do all my religious duties. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, in verse 13, Luke chapter 18, verse 13, the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says here of this man that he went down to his house justified means he was made right in the sight of God rather than the other. Because Jesus says this, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So with all humility, we bear with one another in love. And you know what? The first step every one of us should consider is acknowledging that there's pride in our lives that we need to become free from. The second thing he talks about there, um, he talks about uh, um, humility, and then he talks about gentleness. He says, and gentleness. You know, we often don't think about gentleness in the Christian life, do we? I think it's often kind of a forgotten thing. We just kind of assume that as Christians we're naturally gentle, when actually that's probably not the case, as we still contend with the flesh. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, the Apostle Paul kind of reminds us what gentleness is. He says, when he, they were working among the church, he says, we were gentle among you like a mother caring for little children. That's a great word picture. When you observe a mother caring for little children, you don't see... Her normally, unless she's dealing with some things, you don't normally see her abusive or negligent or, or pushy or harsh with her children. You know, she's, she's gentle with them. She nurtures them. She ministers to them. She, when, when there's a hurt, she comforts the little child. And he says this, he says, we were gentle among you like that like a mother caring for her little child. That's a, a great thought to have when we consider how we ought to bear with one another in love. Even if we have an, an issue with somebody or we don't like the way they do certain things, there's a gentleness that should be 
um, that should exude out of our lives. A gentle, caring, compassionate type of personality. Jonathan Edwards, the uh, Puritan leader, called gentleness the Christian spirit. He says this, he says, All who are truly godly and are real disciples of Christ have a gentle spirit in them. And you know what? I, I recognize that every single one of us has areas in our life that God has to refine to conform us into the image of Christ. But gentleness, I think, is something we could all learn to a greater extent, whether it's in the way we relate to our spouse. Do you speak to your wife? Do you speak to your husband in a gentle way? Do you treat them with gentleness and care? In the way you relate to your fellow brother and sister in Christ. You know what? Maybe, maybe you find yourself clashing with somebody because of their personality. Well, ask the Lord what it would look like in your life to demonstrate the spirit of gentleness to them. You know, when the Old Testament was prophesying about the future Messiah that was to come into the world, he prophesied about Jesus this way in Isaiah 42, 3. It said, says there that Jesus would not break a bruised reed. The Messiah would not break a bruised reed. Meaning somebody, you know, the way I see that is somebody who has already dealt with difficult life circumstances. The Messiah wasn't there to destroy what little was left. But when Isaiah prophesied about what Jesus would be like, the Messiah, he said, the Messiah would not break a bruised reed or snuff out a smoldering wick. It's kind of the, the, the same picture, a smoldering wick, you know, where, where you think the light is just about to be extinguished. You know what, all around you today, especially in the last year and a half, as we've dealt with um, the, 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 the COVID virus and, and these kinds of things, there's been people around you that have been a smoldering wick. And as Christians, we have an opportunity to bear with these people in love and to nurture them as was prophesied about Jesus. Jesus did not come to destroy these bruised reeds or these smoldering wicks. He was there to nurture them. In fact, the Gospels, Jesus says this about himself in Matthew eleven nine. 9. He says, I'm gentle or meek and lowly or humble in heart. When he describes him, his own character, his own personality, he says, I'm gentle. The apostles, Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, 1, he says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. When he's talking about the character of Christ, he says, when I come to you and I, and I communicate the word of God to you, it's through the meekness and gentleness that was found in our Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we bear with one another in love, we need to practice humility and we need to practice gentleness and we need to practice patience. In verse 2, he talks about patience. He says, that uh, this also is a requirement for bearing with one another in love. Albert Moeller has said this about patience. He says, patience must be one of the hallmarks of the Christian home. As each member of the family shows patience in dealing with others, husbands and wives must be patient with each other. Parents must be patient with children. In the household of faith, he says, patience, often that rarest of virtues, becomes a test of authenticity and a necessity for the right ordering of the home, the church, and Christian fellowship. You know, he, he goes as far as to say that the, the level of patience in our lives and how we bear with one another demonstrates authenticity. Are you the real deal? Is the Spirit of Christ at work in your heart and in your life? Are your actions demonstrating a patient attitude? 
when you're, when you're driving down the road and you hit red lights when you're in a hurry. When you're on your way somewhere and, and, and you're driving behind um, some Sunday cruiser who uh, feels it's okay to be driving at 60 kilometers an hour in an 80 zone. You know, as, as life circumstances press all kinds of things upon us, it's sometimes difficult for us to practice patience. And I don't know about you, but I know that when we drive down this highway towards Tosenberg, you can encounter some pretty slow traffic. And I wonder sometimes um, what kind of testimony we're able to portray to the community around us. Are we bearing with one another in love? in a spirit of patience? Do people see us being patient? Do dads, do your children see you being patient with them as they develop and mature in life, as they go through their different stages in life? Are we demonstrating a spirit of patience towards them? Are we demonstrating a spirit of patience towards our, our wives, towards our husbands, when they're dealing with the same thing they've dealt with for the last 20 years. Maybe it's a, a blind spot they have. Maybe they struggle with doubts about something. Do we deal with them in a spirit of patience? Our calling, remember, he says, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And it's with humility, it's with gentleness, and it's with a spirit of patience. And then in verse 3, he says this, eager to maintain the unity. Eager to maintain the unity. Verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. You know, in this scripture passage here, he's not talking about uniformity. You know, sometimes we, we think unity means uniformity. And what I mean by that is sometimes we think unity means that if we all dress the same and we all look the same, we must all be the same. When our hearts can be really, really divided. Um, amongst ourselves. When we, when we demonstrate a spirit of unity, it's not uniformity. But it's the recognition, like he says here, that there's really only one body. You know, as we drive through town, we see multiple churches. We see this flavor and that flavor, you know, whether it's Pentecostal or Anglican or United or Presbyterian or Baptist or Mennonite or whatever you want to call it. There's, there's a different church on every block in some towns. Well, what he's saying here is, and what I'm, I'm not saying that Lighthouse Gospel Church is the only church, and, you know, even if I have a bias towards it. But I recognize when I read this scripture passage that there's only one body. It's the universal body of Christ as it meets throughout the world. There's not just one denomination. He says here that there's only one body and there's only one spirit. He, said, he says there's one body just like there's only one spirit of God. There's not multiple spirits of God. There's only one spirit of God. So there's only one body. There's actually only one hope that belongs to our call. And that's the hope that we're laying up treasures in another place. The hope of salvation. And then he says, <clears throat> just to clarify, there's only one Lord. Every church doesn't have their own deity, their own Lord. In, in, in other religions, they have multiple gods. But in the Christian faith, we only have one Lord. And he says there's only one faith. There's, re there's really only one faith that leads to eternity. And it's like John, 10, John 14 verse 6 says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man will come to the Father except through him. There's only one way. There's only one Lord. There's only, 
there's actually only one faith, even though there's multiple religions in the world, but there's only one faith. There's only one baptism. In our, in our traditions, you know, many of you realize that, that, that people say, oh, that means that, that there's only one water baptism, and if you do anything else in life, then you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit of God. That's not at all what he's talking about here. He's saying just like there's only one Spirit of God, there's only one Lord, there's only one faith, there's only one baptism. And actually, I don't even think he's talking about water baptism here. He's talking about being baptized by the Spirit of God. There's only one baptism of the Spirit of God. It's not the mode, it's not the method. You know, so often we get caught up in this uniformity type of thing. We, we look at methods, we look at modes and all these kinds of things, and, and we get all tripped up. He says there's only one Lord, there's only one faith, there is only one baptism. There's only one God, and there's only one Father of all, and through all and in all. In this scripture verse, he mentions the word eager. He says, if you're bearing with one another in love, you're going to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. That's where we come in, and that's our role. That's the, the work that God has given us. When I think of the word eager, you know, some of the thoughts that come to my mind is when a, when a little child's ready to go to their first day of school. You know, some of you remember that. There was nervousness. There was a little bit of apprehension. But there was this longing, this eagerness. I can't wait till I get to my first day of school. You know, that, that defines eager. Some of you couldn't wait to get your driver's license. You were eager to get your driver's license. You couldn't wait to buy your first car. There was an eagerness about you, that desire to buy your first car. Some of you couldn't wait to get married. There was an eagerness in you to be married. Think about it in, in that term, when you're looking about this thought, eager to maintain the unity in the church. And I think there's, there's a mirror that we can hold up in our own lives and we can ask ourselves this question. Am I eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit? Some of us don't like to maintain things. I mean, I don't, I'm not a mechanic. I don't really enjoy maintaining my vehicle. I hire someone to do it for me. I don't really enjoy maintaining my lawn, but I like the after effects. I don't really enjoy maintaining my house, but I, I like what it looks like after I've maintained it. There's a spirit here that we need to develop as Christians that says, I am eager to maintain the unity in the church. And I can honestly tell you, if we looked at it that way, if we said, you know what, God, you have called me to a great calling. I want to walk worthy of this calling to which you have called me to. And with all eagerness, as I've anticipated other events in my life, I'm going to look out for the best interests of my fellow church brothers and sisters. I'm going to be eager to maintain a spirit of unity among them, which means that when I hear slander or gossip or negativity, I'm not going to encourage that. I'm going to make sure that it, that it sizzles out right where it starts. I'm not going to allow it to grow. I'm not going to feed it. I'm not going to encourage anything like that. In fact, when I see somebody in my church living in sin, I'm going to go talk to them personally in a private way and, and pray for them and, and see how I can help them deal with their situation. Instead of running around and trying to find how many people I can point out to and judge this person for the issue in their life. If we're eager to maintain the unity, we're going to treat other people like we would want to be treated. It's the golden rule. Eager to maintain the unity with one another. And then lastly, look at verse 7. Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. 
when we consider bearing with one another in Christ, let's never lose sight of the fact that God has given us grace. He has given us grace. He has poured His Spirit upon us when we didn't deserve it. Tonight, when we get together for communion, we're going to focus some time on remembering the sacrifice that Christ made for us. You know, every single one of us was doomed to hell. We have all gone astray. We have all committed sin. We all, we're all separated from God. And Christ stepped into the picture to give us another chance, to give us a better life, a better option, an eternal option. Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of God's gift. If God has been so rich in His mercy, His grace towards us, we ought to give other people that kind of grace as well. Even when they mess things up terribly. You know, one of the things that my wife and I have made a practice of in our home is when we offend one another. We have made a deliberate decision that when we go to each other, we acknowledge what we did wrong, specifically, and we ask for forgiveness about how we wronged each other. I bring that up because I think it's an important method of giving grace. When, when we deal with somebody else's offense towards us. And as we consider this theme of bearing with one another in love, recognize if you are the offender, recognize that, that you did you violated something. Maybe you violated your marriage vow. Maybe you violated that covenant that you made with your spouse. Well, you have a responsibility to go to your spouse, acknowledge what you did, and ask for forgiveness. The person who's been offended recognizes, you know, God has been very graceful to me. I didn't deserve heaven. I didn't deserve salvation. But because Christ gave it to me, I respond and turn to you. I forgive you. Because... Christ gave me grace. Grace is given to each one of us, according to this scripture verse, to every single one of us. Nobody sitting here today has not received grace from God. The problem is in how we handle grace. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, the writer there says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. The, the problem that many of us have in life is we, we fail to see how much it took for Christ to forgive us. We don't often enough look at the picture of Christ on the cross and recognize that His life was forfeited for our sake. And then somehow we, we, we hold this power over the people in our lives and we don't offer forgiveness to them and it causes a great defilement. He says here, this root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and many are defiled as a result of you not practicing grace to somebody else in your life. God has given you grace. But you have a responsibility with how you're going to handle that grace. Notice, notice another thought here. 
I want you to think a little bit about this. So often in our life, we, we take up an offense for somebody else. We, we look at a brother or a sister or somebody that we care about deeply, a friend, and we, we look at their marriage sometimes. We analyze their marriage and we're like, you're with that guy and he treats you terribly. You ever do that? And you take up an offense on behalf of someone else that you haven't been given grace for. I really want you to get this. If you want to bear with one another in love, recognize that you ought not to take up an offense for somebody else. Remember that God has given them grace to handle that situation. And I, I've observed this personally. We're, we're in a marriage relationship where, where a, a woman was suffering because of the relationship with her husband. He was not treating her well. But you know what? He wasn't physically abusing her or even verbally abusing her, I don't think. It was just not, it was not a good marriage relationship. She was able to bloom in her relationship with God regardless of what was going on in her marriage relationship. God had given her grace to handle her marriage. But the issue... The problem there was when other people spoke into her life and said, you ought not to put up with that. God had given her grace to deal with the situation. But other people were taking up a greater offense than she was herself. This happens all around us on a regular basis. Remember that God gives us grace to bear with one another in love but God gives you grace for your circumstance in the situation that you're facing at that time. You know, there's, there's times where we need to take a page out of Jesus' book. When Peter looked at John and said, what about him? Jesus said, you know what, Peter, you ought to kind of mind your own business. To bear with one another in love, we recognize these kinds of things. God has given us, each one of us, grace to deal with our current situation. <clears throat> we close with this verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Love this thought. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As we bear with one another in love, as we seek God about our responsibility in regards to this topic, you know what? Tragic things are going to come our way. People are, are not always going to treat us right. But let's remember, God says vengeance is His. He will repay. Let's leave it up to the Lord. And let's not allow bad situations, evil situations to overcome us. But let's overcome them with good by the grace that God has given to each one of us. And you know what? He has not given us only a partial measure of grace. He's given us the exact grace that every single one of us needs to face a certain situation. Never lose sight of that. And as we consider those things, let's give one another grace as well. So may God give us that wisdom to bear with one another in love as we relate to one another. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, you've told us that your word will not return to you void. So, Father, I ask that you would reveal yourself to us, even right now, as you have been already. Lord, as we think of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, Lord, there's some great power in that, Lord. You have called us, Lord, to a high calling. May we walk worthy of that calling, Lord. May we walk in humility and gentleness and patience, Father. May we be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And Father, we ask also that you would help us to give grace and to recognize that you've given us grace. And so, Lord, I pray that as your children, 
we would bear with one another in a spirit of love. That the testimony that comes out of this church would be that of love. That people would be changed by the love that we portray, that we communicate. And Lord, for that, we need your strength. We need wisdom. We need help. We need Jesus, Lord, more than ever. And so, Lord, we ask that you would empower us, Lord. For, Lord, unless you lead us, unless you fill us, unless you guide us, Lord, we cannot fulfill your will. And so, Lord, I ask that you would bring fruit. May we become more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sharing that, Herman. Um, I know that touched me personally. Uh, sometimes if we go to church on Sundays, it's easy to love somebody or it's easy to be patient or humble even. But then we go out into the world and we face reality and the busyness of life sometimes covers us and it's, sometimes it's not easy to be patient and loving and kind and humble. So thank you for that, Herman. And just to practice that no matter where we are, whether we're in church or whether we're outside of church during the, the work week. Um, let's all stand if it's possible. And then uh, we'll close in singing 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord. Still 
my soul will sing your grace unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship him. Herman to do the uh, blessing. Actually, uh, forgot an important announcement before, um, and that is the upcoming wedder, uh, wedding of Peter Miller and Christina Friesen. Everybody standing, will you guys raise your hands so everybody can see you? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Amen. Peter and Christina are getting married on August 28th at 3 p.m. and would appreciate your thoughts and prayers as they prepare for that special day together. One, one other note that I had uh, as well, um, some of you remember that we had also uh, asked Doffy and Lina Tishrob to be deacon, deacons here in the church. Uh, well, just uh, to give you an update there, because of the illness that uh, Doffy is going through, We've put that on hold. Not that they don't qualify, they do qualify. And uh, we've been very blessed by their hospitality, um, by their ministry here in the church, how they've exemplified Christ in so many ways. And so as uh, Dave is going through this difficult time, uh, please remember him in your prayers throughout the course of this week. As God lays him on your heart, please pray for him and Lina and their family. And uh, let's uh, ask the Lord to intervene and do a work there. Let's just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for all the things that you have provided for us. And so, Lord, I just pray that as we go from here, that you would minister to us. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings, Lord. And Father, we ask even now that you would continue to bless your people, Lord. Would you cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious to them, Lord? Father, would you lift up your countenance upon each one here and give them peace? In Jesus' name, amen. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. Keep me true, Lord Jesus, keep me true. There's a race that I must run. God bless you, and we'll see you tonight.